In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Although we hear little about St. John the Baptist, and although there is not a popular devotion to this saint, at least in this country, he is none, nonetheless one of the greatest saints in the church's calendar and is frequently mentioned in the sacred liturgy. And for this, the reason for this is his closeness to the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. St. John the Baptist is the culmination of the entire Old Testament. The purpose and only purpose of the old law was to prepare for Christ. Every sacred event in the lives of the Hebrew people in the Old Testament was a preparation for the Messiah. All of their great leaders and prominent figures were in some way a prefiguration of Christ. St. John the Baptist is the final prophet and greatest of all of these Old Testament figures, for he will actually point out the Messiah. St. John the Baptist also was foretold by the prophets of the Old Testament. And the birth of St. John the Baptist was announced by the Archangel Gabriel. And in this fact, we understand the importance of St. John and how intimately he is related to the Incarnation, that his birth should be predicted by an Archangel, the same that was sent to the Blessed Virgin Mary to announce the Incarnation. St. John, furthermore, was conceived from sterility and old age. Elizabeth was old and she had always been sterile. She could not bear any children. And St. John the Baptist has this birth from sterility and old age in common with some great figures of the Old Testament. Isaac was born of Sarah, who was 90 years old when she conceived of him. And she had been sterile her whole life. And she was hesitant and weak in her belief that she would conceive, because when she heard it, she laughed. And the very name Isaac in Hebrew means laughing, referring to the lack of faith of his mother that she would conceive of him. And the greatest of all of the judges of the Old Testament, those leaders of the Hebrews before the kings, was Samuel, and his mother was Anna. She was sterile and was given to conceive by the power of God. And Saint Anne, the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary, was also without child and could not conceive, but she conceived of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the greatest of all of those miracles was the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ himself was conceived in the womb of a virgin And God performs this miracle of drawing life from sterility and old age in order to humiliate man, to show that the child conceived is not from the will of man, but from the will of God. And this kind of conception in the case of St. John the Baptist and in the other cases that I mentioned, places a special crown of divine predilection and divine mission upon the child. 
St. John the Baptist was also sanctified in the womb of St. Elizabeth at the salutation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary filled with joy over what the Archangel Gabriel had said to her, in a way could not contain herself and wanted to share this joy. And so she went a long distance from Galilee down to Nazareth, down to, to Jerusalem, rather, in order to share this joy with the one person who knew about it, and that was her cousin Elizabeth. Not even St. Joseph knew about it, as we know, for he was going to put her away thinking that she had been unfaithful. And the angel appeared to him in the dream and told him that what was in her womb was of God. So St. Elizabeth, Saint, our Blessed Lady goes to St. Elizabeth and as she arrives and calls out Elizabeth's name, the child leaps for joy in the womb of St. Elizabeth. That's St. John the Baptist. And why does the child leap? Because Our Lady has in her womb the God-man, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, sanctity itself. And St. John the Baptist is sanctified in the womb of St. Elizabeth. He is cleansed of original sin simply by the sanctifying presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And St. Elizabeth comes and says, How is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Knowing by divine inspiration that Our Lady is the mother of God, why would she say that? The mother of my Lord, who is my Lord but my God? And why do Protestants therefore deny the Catholic doctrine that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mother of God when it is plainly stated by St. Elizabeth and in the Gospel of St. Luke? Why do they deny? They who profess such attachment to the scriptures. And St. John led a life of extreme mortification. His mission was to prepare a holy people for the Messiah. In fact, this was the mission of the entire Old Testament. From the time of Abraham, from approximately 2000 BC, And just as a pyramid comes to a great point at the top where all things meet in it, so all of the events of these 2,000 years from the time of Abraham up to the time of Christ come together as a point in the Old Testament where the entire Old Testament will fulfill its purpose in St. John the Baptist. It was therefore necessary in order to prepare the Jewish people for a spiritual messiah to detach them from their worldly ways and their materialism. They were expecting a temporal messiah, a messiah who would free them from the Roman rule and who would put the Jews in the place of prominence throughout the whole world and forever. Political and material success. This is what they were looking for. And it was because of that very expectation that they will put the true Messiah to death because he was not what they were expecting. And so God sends St. John the Baptist to tell them what to expect. 
His appearance, therefore, was one of an emaciated man living in the wilderness. He lived by the Jordan, which was the desert. He was sent out at the earliest age. He ate grasshoppers. He had animal skins for his clothing. From the worldly point of view, he was unkempt. He didn't cut his hair. He was a sight to behold. This man out in the desert preaching in the wilderness. And this very outward appearance would have riveted the attention of anyone. And clearly made the statement of penance for sin and detachment from the world. His very appearance spoke those words. Penance for sin, detachment from the world. These two things are necessary in order that we receive the Holy Gospel. And those who did receive among the Jews had these two qualities of penance for sin and detachment from the world. St. John gave the baptism of water as a symbol of penance for sin. The baptism of St. John was a precursor to the baptism of Christ. It was not the same baptism that you receive. It did not remove original sin, but it did excite penance. And St. John had the privilege of baptizing our Lord himself, at which time the Father and the Holy Ghost descended above our blessed Lord and gave testimony to the fact that Christ was the true Son of God. Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this marked the beginning of Christ's public ministry. St. John had the singular privilege of pointing out the Messiah to the Jewish people as if the last act or the last word of the Old Testament he pointed his finger at Christ in front of everyone when Christ descended to the Jordan to be baptized. And he said solemnly, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who taketh away the sin of the world. In a single sentence, saying everything that every prophet and every patriarch wanted to say, summing up the 2,000 years of preparation in a single sentence, behold the Lamb of Christ, be the Lamb of God, behold the Messiah, behold the Anointed One. And by saying this, St. John is already predicting our Lord's passion and death, for he says, who taketh away the sin of the world, and he will take that away by his passion and death. St. John boldly condemned the illicit marriage of Herod. Herod had married in a way that was contrary to the Jewish law. It was an invalid marriage. And this is not the Herod who murdered the babies after Bethlehem. This is a descendant of that same king, and he was tetrarch of Galilee by the permission of the Romans who controlled everything. And it was to him that, that Pilate sent our blessed Lord at his passion. St. John therefore publicly condemned this unlawful marriage as a witness to the observance of the law, the Mosaic law. And in this we see great fortitude 
and a saintly contempt for human respect. St. John was therefore beheaded for the truth. St. John enraged the false wife of Herod by this condemnation. And in revenge, she demanded that he be beheaded and that his head be placed on a platter and brought up to a banquet. This shows that God does not necessarily spare those whom he loves. He subjected St. John the Baptist to arrest, to imprisonment, to humiliation, to abandonment, and finally to an ignominious death and even the humiliation in death of being presented on a platter at a banquet banquet of filthy, dirty sinners. All of these sufferings at the hands of sinners were St. John's glory, for it made him conform all the more perfectly to the sacrifice of Christ the Savior, which is the glory of everyone that receives the waters of baptism. to be conformed to the sacrifice of Christ the Savior. And this gave to St. John an imperishable crown of glory for having witnessed unto the truth. Remember what Pilate, what our Lord said to Pilate, for this have I come into the world to witness unto the truth. And those who are of the truth hear my voice. And St. John, by his severed head, witnesses unto the truth and is conformed thereby to Christ the Savior. And we may add here the blasphemy of Bergoglio, who said that St. John the Baptist doubted concerning Christ's messianic dignity. How could he doubt when he pointed him out, when it was St. Andrew himself who heard the words of St. John, pointing out Christ, and who came to his brother St. Peter and said, I have found the Messiah. How could he doubt when God the Father and God the Holy Ghost descended in the presence of Christ and St. John, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. How could he doubt? What are the spiritual lessons to be learned from St. John the Baptist? First of all, that God confounds men. St. John the Baptist was conceived by a miracle, and furthermore, his appearance was something which would have shocked and disgusted the worldly-minded. God always wants to bring man down because his original sin was to puff himself up. And in dealing with us, he does a mercy to us by bringing us down all the time. When we go up, we are brought down by his mercy. He did this in the 19th century. He does it with all saints but it was particularly evident in the 19th century. The 19th century was extremely pleased with itself because of its scientific advancements. The steam engine, for example. Electricity. 
many other advancements. Photography, very pleased with itself. It felt that it had arrived, that the human intellect had finally figured everything out. It was loaded with rationalism, meaning that if something did not conform to human reason, it couldn't be true, because we know everything. What saints did he raise up? Did he raise up a St. Thomas Aquinas to respond to all of those things? Some great doctors of the church? No. The two most prominent saints of the 19th century were the Curie of Ars and St. Bernadette Subiru. And who are they? The Curie of Ars is famous for the fact that he could not get through his seminary training because he was too dumb. And he had to be trained privately by a priest until he could finally pass his exams. And he was held in ridicule by the rest of the priests of the diocese. He was so maligned for his supposed stupidity that some of the priests sent around a petition to the bishop to relieve him of his duties because he was incapable. And when the petition came around to him, he signed it. And it went to the bishop, and the bishop would have none of it, to his great credit. And he was so good in the confessional, in advising souls how to get to heaven, that people came even from this country on ships with sails that took weeks to cross, people from this country came just to go to confession to him. He was such an effective priest because he loved God so much that whatever was lacking in his brain, he understood by the inspiration of God and by his intimacy with divine things through his prayer and through the offering of his heroic apostolic life. St. Thomas Aquinas, who was probably the most intelligent man that ever existed, said that he learned the most from kneeling in front of the crucifix. Because the wisdom of God far exceeds the intelligence of man. And so the 19th century, proud of itself, proud as a peacock, was humiliated by the fact that this apparently dumb man would attract the attention of the whole world in a tiny, insignificant town in France. For he was given the worst of all assignments because he was considered to be the bottom of the priestly barrel. God confounds men. And St. Bernadette Subiru, she could not receive her first communion because she didn't know her catechism. She was 12 years old, because at that time you received first communion at 12. And at 12 years old, she could not no, she couldn't recite her catechism. But what happened to her? Well, the lady came as she was gathering wood to burn in her house. They were dirt poor. And the lady appeared. She didn't know who she was. And finally, after many apparitions, the priest said to her, ask the lady who she is. And she went back to the lady, and the lady said, I am the Immaculate Conception. And she brought this to the priests, and the priests were stunned because they knew that she could never come up with that idea, being ignorant as she was, not very intelligent, not even knowing her basic catechism. How could she come up with the idea 
the immaculate, of the Immaculate Conception. Furthermore, they were stunned by what she said. She said, I am the Immaculate Conception. She did not say, I have had an Immaculate Conception. But she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Meaning that she is the only one of all humanity that qualifies for that great privilege. And they understood immediately by these responses of St. Bernadette that the lady was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so St. Bernadette, who doesn't know about St. Bernadette of Subiru? There was even a film made about her. Yet she was one of the most ignorant and unintelligent people of the 19th century because God confounds human beings. And we see this same confounding in St. John the Baptist. Second, we should learn penance, mortification, and detachment from the things of this world. It is only by practicing these things that we can hope to be faithful to the Holy Gospel. Otherwise, we will resist it. We will resist the graces that God sends us. And it was for lack of these things that the most of the Jews failed to recognize Christ. Thirdly, we should have a contempt for human respect. We must always stand for the truth in all things, whether or not it, it, it pleases important people in our lives. No matter who they should be, many times <clears throat> they are relatives whose love and esteem we will lose if we profess and live by the Catholic faith. Their love and esteem, yes, St. John lost his head. And we worry about what they will think about us, how they will treat us. He lost his head. Fourth, God does not necessarily protect from harm those whom he loves. In fact, the more he loves someone, the more crosses he will send. It is the formula of salvation and sanctity which we never completely understand. The more he loves us, the more crosses he will send. This is because the path to eternal glory is not pleasure but the cross. God will exercise the virtue of those whom he especially loves by sending intense crosses to bear. Who appears to be more abandoned than St. John the Baptist? Yet whom did God esteem more than St. John with the exception of his own mother and St. Joseph? And finally, we should behold the Lamb of God. St. John's great moment was his instruction to behold the Lamb of God. For this, St. John was created, and for this he went out into the desert. We have the Lamb of God before us in the Holy Eucharist. The priests hold the priest holds it up in front of you and says the very words of St. John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Let us look at him. And this means that the attention of Catholics should be riveted on the things of the next world and not of the things on the things of this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.